And now, the host of Quirks of Israel, Reverend Peter Faust. Hello, everyone. Good to see you. Good to see you today. Welcome, welcome. It is good to be back. It is good. Good to see you. Oh, looking stylish up there. All right. You're welcome. Good to be back. Good to be back. All right. Well, let's get started. Welcome to episode 19 of the Quirks of Israel. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Today's episode is called Remembrance and Barbecue. I trust by now, after 18 episodes, you are beginning to see the quirky, unique, and beautiful side to Israel. Obviously, we have barely scraped the surface. There is so much to Israel that a show like this could not contain without going on for years. I deliberately chose not to delve into the political nature of Israel or the occurrences of conflict over the past century or the religious nature in the only Jewish state in the world. Not because these issues aren't important, far from it, but simply because most people tend to only look at Israel through this lens. And I am trying to pry that door open, expand your vision, and show them a side of Israel the vast majority of people have never considered. Israel is a package, and it must be viewed and explored through context. The context of history, biblical, post-biblical, and modern. The context of Israel's legal right to exist. The context of faith and religious expression. The context of conflict, both wars, terrorism, security, and peace treaties. The complex context of her neighbors, which naturally includes the Palestinian Arabs. The context of political society and how the government operates. The context of anti-Semitism is also a major subject to explore that naturally predates the modern state of Israel, but is vital to unpack. History is so important, and most of the confusion and problems occur when people don't understand the history, they make generalizations, assumptions, insert prejudice, and so forth. So why do I go on this ramble? Well, because today's episode deals with remembrance and barbecues, of course. But I want to zoom in first on the word remembrance. The Jewish people are a people of memory. I think this sums up a major aspect to their survival, faith, community, endurance, productivity, and so on. Their ancestral homeland is central which gave rise to modern or political Zionism, but which is encapsulated in what I would call biblical Zionism, such as what the psalmist in 137, 5 to 6 declares, If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. The word Zionism gets thrown around like a frisbee in many circles today, and I would say a majority of the usage and intended meaning is incorrect. So let's define it here, because it's part of the fabric of remembrance, and I'd say a driving force in nearly all Jewish people in the world. A definition of modern Zionism could be described as the belief that the Jewish people have a political, biblical, historical, and or moral right to self-determination and a peaceful existence within the borders of their ancient homeland, today known as Israel. If you believe this, as I do, congratulations, you're a Zionist. Okay. Zionism plays a central key part of remembrance and connectivity for Jews in the diaspora and those living in Israel today. Remembrance is actually a biblical mandate to teach their children and their children and their children, to erect monuments, to remember and identify with the past, to reflect and not forget, but to push forward and blaze trails, to preserve faith, family, tradition, life, and a connection to the land and promises, to strive as a nation among nations, a covenantal people that often wrestles with this reality and has done so since Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
The Jewish people have experienced mighty blessings, but have also journeyed through fire in history from wars, expulsions, hardships, persecution, and rebuilding. Amidst all the 4,000 years of history, I see the faithfulness of God in covenant, which is an unconditional relationship he sealed with Abraham and his descendants. A literal land, a literal people, and through them, the world would experience blessings. This has happened, is happening, and will continue to happen. God's incredible plan that gives all the glory to his name. The land of Israel, Jerusalem, and the Temple Mount is the epicenter of the world. It is the navel. It is central, a common statement echoed from the mouths of Jewish people around the globe during every Passover is Lashana Chaba'a Be Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. Jewish people pray three times a day facing Jerusalem wherever they are. At every traditional Jewish wedding, they break a glass, remembering the destruction of the temple. Every Tisha B'Av, the ninth of the Hebrew month of Av, Jews all over the world fast and lament the destruction of the first and second temple. The name Israel is mentioned 2,314 times in the Older Testament and 85 times in the Newer Testament. And every time it means the people and nation of Israel. The name Jerusalem is mentioned 664 times in the Older Testament and 151 times in the Newer Testament. Contrast this with the Quran and Jerusalem is never even mentioned once. So each year in Jerusalem, in Israel, three remembrances occur. They have become a part of the fabric of Israeli life and for Jews all around the world. These three observances have a very unique and interesting order of when they occur and how the nation and people reflect. So to help put this into perspective, we will look, okay, at the calendar year of 2022. So the first remembrance is Yom HaShoah, which begins in the evening of Wednesday, April 27th, and ends the following day on the 28th in the evening. Okay, and we're looking at 2022. So as a side note, in the Bible and the and Jewish tradition, days begin at sundown and end the following evening the next day. So a day begins with light and ends with light. Just think on that for a moment. Yom HaShoah is known in English as Holocaust Remembrance Day, but the Hebrew word Shoah is a much better description than the word Holocaust when we consider the brutal murder of over 6 million Jewish men, women, and children by Nazis during World War II. The word Holocaust can mean a, gr a great or complete devastation or destruction, especially by fire, or a sacrifice con completely consumed by fire, or a burnt offering, whereas Shoah simply translated means catastrophe. Now what happened to the mass slaughter and murder of over 6 million Jews was definitely not a burnt offering or sacrifice or even to understand it as a devastation or destruction by fire falls short. It was an absolute horrific catastrophe on an unthinkable evil level that any sensible person cannot comprehend. Jews were shot, gassed, buried alive, burned, hung, starved, drowned, and the list goes on. So although the word and the world uses the common English word Holocaust to relate to this awful period in Jewish history, the word Shoah and its meaning is far more appropriate to describe what happened. These horrific crimes were committed against European Jewry by Nazi Germany, which prior to the Nazis, Germany had been considered for centuries to be one of the most civilized Christian nations of Europe. Along with Nazi Germany, many other European countries, political leaders, and everyday people aided and abetted the Nazis in their plot to rid Europe and the world of the Jewish people. On Yom HaShoah, memorial services will be held all over the world remembering the countless victims of the Nazi Reich. Names will be read, candles lit, museum exhibits attended, and in Israel a siren will blast as millions of Israelis will stand silently, heads bowed and eyes closed. For many, tears will be flowing. 
Even countless cars in the cities and highways will stop their occupants getting out and standing upon the road, thinking about the millions who were murdered, their lives taken from them for the crime of being Jewish. The second remembrance comes a few days later, at sundown on May 3rd to sundown on May 4th, when Yom Hazikron is observed. This is Israeli Memorial Day. On this day, the nation remembers and mourns the fallen soldiers of the wars of Israel and the victims of actions of terrorism. Traditionally, this day commemorated the fallen soldiers enacted into Israeli law in 1963, but it has also extended to civilian victims of terror. The country will mourn their losses. Now around 23,928 fallen soldiers, they'll attend ceremonies, visit grave sides of loved ones, and reflect on the cost of war, freedom, and a yearning for peace. It is a somber and sobering day. Now the third remembrance occurs the very next day. At sundown on May 5th, to sundown on May 6th is Yom Ha'atzmaut, Israeli Independence Day. Now you may have heard that Israel was reborn on May 14th, 1948, and you'd be correct. But this is the Gregorian date. The Hebrew date was the 5th of Ayer, 5708. So in Israel, the celebration of Israeli Independence Day is on the Hebrew day and month, not the Gregorian. This day is dynamite. There are concerts, there are parties, fireworks, dancing, festivities, flag waving, face paint, and don't forget barbecues. Any green space possible will be crammed with barbecues and families roasting all kinds of meats and having picnics. When my wife and I lived in Jerusalem, we rented a flat that was on the fourth and fifth floor of a high rise apartment. So I could stand on my balcony, look over the neighborhood of Nachalot and see a haze of smoke from all the barbecues over Sakhir Park, where thousands of Israelis had converged to spend the day with family. The celebrations are jubilant, even with flyovers of Israeli jets and airliners to the delight of the crowds. When darkness descends, fireworks light up the sky and the streets are full of people singing, cheering and having a great time. They celebrate the establishment of Israel after 2,000 years. They remember the hard-fought war for survival in 1948, where five Arab armies attacked the infant reborn state to destroy it, yet failed. The significance of these three remembrances is deep. First, one mourns the murder of six million Jews. Two of every three Jewish people living in Europe, one third of world Jewry. And then the next remembrance is for the victims of terrorism and the fallen soldiers of the state of Israel. Finally, after this memorial of the fallen, one is filled with joy for the reality and miracle that is Israel. Israel is reborn, millions have returned, and for a Christian like me, I see the faithfulness of God and recall Psalm 117, one of the Hallel Psalms, where the psalmist speaks to the nations about what God has done for his people, Israel. And it says, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples, for his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. The Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation with Bridges for Peace, along with many other friends, have celebrated this day as a day of praise, where Jews and Christians come together, recite and sing the Psalms of Hallel and recognize that really when one thinks about it, if God is behind this, as I believe he is, and if he is regathering his people back to the land as the prophets foretold, as I believe he is, and if the rebirth of Israel was part of his prophetic plan, as I believe it is, then really Israeli Independence Day ought to be a celebration of his faithfulness and enshrined as a call to praise his name. I mean, it's right in the text of scripture. The Gentiles will praise God when they see his mighty acts of faithfulness to his people, Israel. I'll let you marinate on that for a moment as uh, that stirs around in your brain. We want to love what God loves and of course he loves everyone in the world, but I believe he has a special place for his people, Israel, not because of anything they've done, 
but because he is faithful to his covenant towards them. He has a plan and a purpose for them, just as he has a plan and a purpose for you. And at the end of the day, as the prophet Ezekiel declares in chapter 36, it's for his name's sake. Israel is quirky. Join me on episode 20 of the Quirks of Israel as I bring to you experiencing the feasts of the Lord in Israel. Cheers and Shalom.